Chapter 4, and Deg. The world changed when father was home. Everyone had to be more careful and orderly. When mama and grandma were in charge, there was a way to do things, of course, and yet there was room to make mistakes. Mistakes were funny and could be fixed. With Omakaisa's father, Mikwam, or Ice, everything had to be done exactly right. He was a commanding person, over six feet tall, and with a shrewdness in his expression that impressed other men. Often, he dressed himself quite handsomely. Full turban, beaded vest, velvet vest, calico shirt, a fine red cloth, a bandolier bag, earrings. He always wore at least one fancy earring, and it glittered and spun at his jaw when he abruptly halted or changed direction in his walking. Mikwam was very funny. The camp was always full of laughter, but it was an uneasy laughter. At any moment, Day-Day's mood could change to barbed annoyance. Much of the laughter had to do with father's sly wit and sharp tongue. There was no one he could not imitate, no one he could who no one who escaped the sharp humor of his gaze, no one about whom he could not make a joke. He even teased old Tallow, but he loved giving her little gifts too, and in the evenings he told stories until way after the owls began to call. With Day Day home, things were more exciting. Things were more difficult. Things were less predictable, but somehow more secure. First thing Day Day noticed was the corn, how tall it had grown, how the rain had plumped up the ears, what a good crop they had this year. Mama and Grandma were pleased and contented with the crop, but Day Day was jealous of the amount of new corn he saw the crows devouring. Early on the morning of the second day he was home, he cut poles and used basswood twine to rope together two platforms one on either side of the field. When he had tied the legs securely and when he had positioned them just so, he called Angeline and Omicaius. I want you to climb up and stay here and drive away the birds. He gave Omicaius two smooth sticks to clap together to frighten the fox and Angeline his tattered old shirt to flap in the, the air. He didn't, need, he didn't need it anymore for Mama had made him a new suit of clothes, a calico shirt, skin leggings, a set of blue broadcloth breeches trimmed with red wool. Onto the shirt, she had sewn four carefully hoarded brass buttons, gleaming, each marked with the French flower the voyagers had called fleur de lis. Now, on a sunny day with a sweet haze in the air and a promise of rain low and far on the edge of the horizon, Omakaius and Angeline started for the cornfield. They argued back and forth about everything and nothing. Stubborn and bored with each other, they fell silent. The garden place lay at the end of the short path through the woods and on the way they walked without a sound, each lost in her thoughts. Perhaps because they had fallen into that angry silence, they walked quietly enough to come upon one horn the magnificent buck deer who had lost half of his antler rack defending his island territory. He seemed to have damaged his head in some way so that only one of his antlers grew back, back properly. It was a beautiful antler, proud and pointed, but the other was only a stump. Unafraid of the girls, one horn stepped out onto the path and stood alert in the early light, basking a little warmer his coat. Omicaius and Angeline stood still, held by his beauty and the strength of his gaze. His graceful leaf-shaped ears tilted forward as though he could hear their hearts beating. His brown eyes were commanding and kind. He took a step toward them and stopped. Another step stopped. And then suddenly, as though yanked into the air by a giant invisible rope, he leaped. He disappeared. He must have heard something we didn't, Angeline said. And sure enough, Day Day was behind them, right behind them with no warning. What's wrong with you girls, he said, his voice sharp. The crows are feasting while you stand here and jabber. He walked past them, his stride long. They hurried to the field, climbed onto the platforms, and shooed away what few birds had settled in the corn. At first, it was fun to wave and shout across the field with, from their perches. Booze who called Omakaius. Booze who called Angeline. Nindu Wesson, Omakaius yelled. I'm hungry too, was the answer. What did you bring to eat? Angeline had brought nothing. We could roast some corn suggested Omicaius from across the field. We could roast some crows, cried Angeline. How will we catch them, shouted Omicaius. I'll get Nokomis's fishing net, Angeline answered. We'll throw it over them when they land. So far, not a single bird had eaten so much as a kernel of corn because the two girls were making so much noise. But as soon as Angeline left her stand to fetch the net from Grandma, a whirling cloud descended. The smart crows and red-winged blackbirds knew when their chance of getting a bite of corn had improved. The crows spread over the corn with cry of greed, cries of greed. 
ravens, bigger and smarter, waited on the outskirts of the field to see whether it was safe to join the feast. Determined, Omachias yelled louder and clacked her sticks. She had helped harvest each seed saved in Mama's seed bag. She had watered those seeds with water hauled from the lake, McCook after McCook of water, until it sprouted and grew. Then she had loosened the earth and weeded with Mama's big moose antler hoe and her own smaller hoe car from a crooked tree branch. She had guided these corn plants and worked hard, and she was not now going to give up the winter's dried corn soup to a flock of birds, no matter how hungry they were. Again, the birds fell on the corn and circled with starving cries. Again, Omakaius ran down, screaming to drive them off. Dede was right. The birds had eyes glittered greedily as they tore into each plump ear of corn and pecked at the juicy young kernels. Their cries were ferocious. Until her sister returned, Omakaius ran from one end of the field to the other, shouting and flapping her, her dad's old shirt or clacking their sticks. After a time, she was too tired to run fast, and her shout came out as a croak as hoarse as a crow's. Angeline returned with the net, finally, and they tried to cast it over the birds. The net worked much better at catching fish. However wide and gracefully they tried to toss it, the net always flew clumsily. The birds saw it coming, darted off, and even seemed to laugh with taunting cries as they landed, eating noisily in another part of the field. We've got to trick them, Angeline said. Trick them how, Omakaius panted. I've got an idea, said Angeline. They draped one of Grandma's nets carefully over the corn stalks to make a ceiling. Angeline stood behind the cornstalk row with the with the other net held wide, and Omakaius ran to the other side of the field. When the birds landed before her, she slowly and hurriedly, with no shouting and no sudden movements, walked toward her sister. The birds hopped before her or flew a short distance. They were not frightened enough to wheel high in the air. They continued toward the net and then slipped under the nets to forage, hopped further beneath toward Angeline until they finally ran into the wall of twines and flapped high into the ceiling of the net. In alarm, they panicked, tried to fly through the links Nokomis had woven and caught a foot, a wing, a tiny head. Even though she had hated them just an hour before, Omakaius Oma now felt badly about betraying them. And as she drove the birds into the net, she begged them to forgive her, saying the words she had heard her grandmother use. Forgive us, forgive us. We have need, we have need.